advice to directors in how to choose an editor, what to look for. Mm -hmm. This is a Latir of the Independent Film School interviewing filmmakers whose work premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. Links below this video to join us for the many free trainings that we offer. Hello and welcome. I'm here with Arthur Tarnowski, who is the editor of Irena's Vow. A difficult watch and very satisfying. A meaningful film about courage and integrity that's based on a true story, which adds that extra layer of reminding audiences that courage and integrity is, doesn't just uh, belong in the realm of fictional characters. So it's one of those movies you really uh, remember after you watch it. So Arthur, what drew you to Irena's Vow? What had you choose this project? Well, it's, uh, you know, in, in life, uh, things happen sort of serendipitously. Um, I was supposed to do another, uh, series and at the last minute they had a sort of scheduling change. And so that kind of fell apart. And the, the day after I saw, uh, the actress, Sophie Nelis, who's the star of the film on one of our local talk shows in Quebec, where she mentioned she would be doing a film with Louise Archambault, the director which would be shooting in Poland and it's a World War II story. When I heard that, I just took a chance and I wrote to her uh, because I'm, uh, uh, my parents are both Polish. Uh, I'm born and raised in Canada, but both my parents came here and migrated as refugees in the 50s. And, um, and basically, uh, I said, you know, if there's a Quebec, Canada co-production with Poland, I have to, I have to find a way to get involved. So. I just said, you know, by any chance, if you need a Polish passport carrying person, and if you need someone who speaks Polish, I'd be happy to help. So she wrote me back a few minutes later and she sent me the script. I read it and I was blown away and, mm -hmm. uh, and off to the races we went. And I actually, uh, sort of flew down there cause I have a lot of family still in Poland and I spent a couple mm -hmm. of weeks. I actually, cause I was supposed to edit in Montreal, the co-production thing, but I just, uh, to rented a room there and then worked for a few weeks while, while they were shooting, which was an amazing experience as well. Got to meet some other editors who were in the same facility, got to meet the crew, got to meet other people in the film. So it was, you know, editors, we tend to stay in our dark room. So it was nice to go out there. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's a great, great story. I do want to ask you though, off of this story. Generally think people think of the editor as the person who comes after the film has been shot. Yeah. And you're talking about being there for two or three weeks. I think you said while they were shooting. Yeah. And yeah. so what does your work look like as an editor during the shoot? Well, the generally speaking, the way I work and most of the people I know work is the film or series starts shooting and within two, three days, when you have already two, three days of material, you can start assembling, mm. putting things together. I mean, there are many advantages to doing that while we're shooting. Obviously the first one being, if you feel that something is missing, you can tell it to the director and they'll maybe pick up a shot and say, oh, it'd be nice to get a close up of this or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. It was also the first time I was working with Louise, the director. So just being there, because I knew that the experience of shooting that film would, would be a special one for her. Uh, and it's also just so that I'm sort of at the same level as the director when they arrive in the editing room. So we're not sort of, she's way ahead of the curve because she knows all the material. And, you know, if I've put it together, then I'm, I have a sense of it as well. And so while we were there, we, we even had discussions of how the film was going to start and maybe trying this or that. And she actually saw a few versions while she was shooting and maybe influenced how she was going to shoot another scene. So, so it's very useful. It's a very useful thing to be there. Well, oh, wow. yeah. so during the shoot, you're watching the dailies and you're, you're, you're watching every bit of the footage and you know it really well, by the time they're done shooting, you're very familiar with what's been shot. Yeah. And in theory, within two or three weeks, max after the shoot, there is a sort of skeleton or a version of the film, which, you know, usually is, I try on my first cuts, I'll, I'll never take things out, even though. I'm convinced like some moments I know will not be in the finished film just because it's redundant. And, you know, when you write a script, you have to be very explanatory about things, but then the performance of the actors, 
it will say something with a look much more than a line of dialogue. So you kind of know as you're putting it together that maybe we don't uh, need that stuff. But for the assembly, I think it's always important to have all those things in there so that we register them at least once. And then after when we start taking them out, the amount of times that it happened that we sort of take things out early and then towards the end, we're like, oh, this doesn't quite work, does it? And then we remember, oh, that line we took out, we'll just put it back. And all of a sudden everything makes sense. So it's, you know, it's kind of like the architecture of the film before and, and then we finesse. Very interesting. It makes so much sense that it's, uh, it's easier to take things out than to put things yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah, the French have a great expression for that cut. They call it the bear because it's huge. Like the, the whole film, like, you know, sometimes on a two hour film, it'll be three hours long or four hours yeah. long. Like it depends. So let me ask you, um, your work as an editor, you've been editing from what I can tell since the mid nineties. You've yep. been at this for a minute. Yeah. 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 Half, <laughs> half, half my life, basically. Yeah. So half your life. And something that our audience wonders about is at this point in your career are you still because i'm interested in the story where you reached out to a director are you still needing to look for work or is the work finding you and you get to decide how choosy do you get to be in terms of keeping the lights on mm -hmm. um and at what point you know, has that changed over the course of your career in terms of how choosy you can be with the projects you take? You know, I think as freelancers, there's part of us that never says no to anything because you just never know, you know, that project that looks amazing might not happen for two years because of financing or whatever. So you say yes, and then you hope that it works out. And then you say, yes, what gets very difficult as an editor is you create a network of film directors or filmmakers you're, you work with. But when two of them you really enjoy working with have the same schedule on a film, that mm. that's where it gets difficult because you, you don't want the other person to feel like, well, I like your script less. That's why I'm doing this one. Or I like you less. That's why. So it's always very, you know, I. I've heard stories of editors who've done eight films with someone and the day that they said no to a film because they had another project, that person never called them again. So it can be cool. very, it can be very harsh. I've been lucky that I have not really looked for work that much. There's been like, you know, a month here, a month there where, you know, uh, but oftentimes the problem is overlapping projects. That's the most mm -hmm. difficult because you say yes to something that's supposed to start like in October, it ends up starting in November, December. And you thought you'd be available in February for the next thing, but now that's all kind of tumbling over. And, and honestly, you know, when I, I got to the age of 40, which was unfortunately a few years ago, uh, I, it, that's where there was a switch that happened where the people I worked with were more important than necessarily the projects. Although, right. you know, obviously the project is important and, and I'll always read a script before I accept anything, but, but I think it's, you know, you just realize that. I'm going to spend four months with this person. If I know I'm going to get along well with them, that goes a very long way. And then, mm -hmm. you know, there's all these multiple factors. I've never been involved in something that, oh my God, this is a catastrophe. Like, what are we going to do? You know, I'm one of those, you know, life gives you lemons, you make lemonade kind of people. So I, <laughs> I always think there's something to be done. Oh. Mm -hmm. Can I, I'm going to ask a Snoopy question and you decide if you want to answer it or sure, not. Sure. Sure. Um, <clears throat> At this point, as a, a veteran editor, like what's the budget range with which you're willing to consider a project? Is there like a minimum budget below with below which it just wouldn't make sense to you? And has that have those numbers changed over the course of your career? Like at what budget levels did you begin? Well, I actually, funnily enough, it's 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 been varied because I I live in Canada and we live in a you know, a system where it's subsidized filmmaking. So f feature films never go that high. You know, there's certain budgetary restrictions. Where I've worked on bigger budgets is usually on series or co-productions or an American show. Like I just worked on an American show, which had a very consequential budget. Um, mm -hmm. But at, at the end of the day, when it's a, a, a commercial thing, like a TV mm -hmm. series for a big stream or something, then then obviously you expect to be paid a certain amount. 
Right. But I'll give you an example. In the last three years, I've worked on three features where I was barely paid anything because I believed in the project and I believed in the filmmaker. And, and actually, I, I did a film, one of the less amount money I've been paid in 15 years, where it was a, a Haitian co-production with Canada and France. And, uh, it was more of a gut feeling. I liked the filmmaker. I thought, the, first of all, I just thought it was great to help someone on a sort of Haitian film, which is doing his first feature. And, and lo and behold, we're going to Sundance in two weeks because the film was taken to Sundance. So, oh, you know, so it's, choose, really. you, you get, you get paid in other ways, well, but yes. So cool. Yeah. It's so, uh, it's so inspiring and, and hopeful and reassuring to hear that someone who is quite advanced in their career is still making decisions on the basis of what projects speak to you rather than the bottom line. And I do think that a lot of filmmakers, especially when you start out, you don't even try to reach out to, you know, people won't even try to reach out to someone like you because they'll assume that they mm -hmm. have to have $20 million to yeah. even, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I just think it's really hopeful <laughs> to hear that at the end of the day, it is a group of artists who create this work and what inspires us is the passion and the meaning behind it and, yeah. and the joy that we get from the people we work with and not, not the spreadsheet. I think I, just to say, I think I'm lucky too, that where I live in Canada, because of the way the films are made and financed, um, there is that luxury of, of the artistic endeavor and not mm. necessarily because those films are not expected to make money. They almost never do. Uh, so it's a really different approach. Whereas, you know, when you work on a movie where there's a bottom line, I, I don't think those things have to be mutually exclusive. Like, no. I, I think you can aspire no. to be successful. But you're rubbing it in with the U.S. crowd. No, no. There is, there's no funding for the arts. No, but I've, that's yeah, no, I, I hear you. No, but I would compare it to like the independent film in the U.S., yeah. you know, where it's yeah, like, yeah. A, you know, two, $3 million budget. You know, it's not a lot of money, but you make, you know, what you can. And, and but it, it makes for really creative films, I find generally. Yeah. Yeah. No, in the United States, there isn't any funding for the arts and certainly not independent films. And so when you try to put an independent film together, you have to convince people that the film's going to make money. It's not about showing the inherent value of the creative work. So, yeah. Saddens, saddens me. And that is the, that is By the, the way, reality. it's not a given here. We're struggling all the time because, you know, there are a lot of groups and people are, who are saying like, we don't like our Canadian films. They're boring and we don't want to pay for that anymore. So, so there is a struggle. Uh, there is a struggle here too. It's not like we just give money away and stuff. So it's not an easy thing here as well. Yeah. There are a few different questions I want to ask you and I'm, I'm weighing between them. Um, well, I have to ask this. If um, advice to directors and how to choose an editor, what to look for, mm -hmm. what would you say to directors about that? Well, first of all, I think if you sit down with that person and have a meal or talk with them for an hour, you'll kind of get a sense like, can I get along with this person? Because you're going to spend three months in a room and, and sometimes it's just the personality of the person. The, the most important thing is that you choose someone whom you feel is making the same film you want to make. Obviously you want the editor, the whole point of an editor is to bring a different energy and someone who will enhance your vision and give you more than what you even expected. But when you hire an editor, you're hiring a personality, a point of view. Obviously the skills of the editor are important. You know, if someone's never cut an action film and the whole film is action. That's not, it doesn't mean that someone who's never cut action can do it, but, but certainly you're going to get someone with, with a few tricks up their sleeve who's done it before. And, you know, one of the things you can see like on a, a resume of an editor is if they've worked several times for the same director, that usually means yeah. that, you know, their trust is, is with them. Um, right. But sometimes it's tricky. Like you could see someone who's worked for five times with the same director. But then you find out that the director is really involved in, in the editorial, like in a very, very strong way. So you have to kind of look for those things. 
uh, mm-hmm. uh, the different projects they've done with different people, how they turned out. And, and obviously I would talk to other directors who worked with that editor and see what mm-hmm. their feeling is, you know. Um, mm-hmm. But I would say, yeah, definitely, you know, kind of do your research. And obviously if you see a film that you liked and you felt the editing was quite good, then you, right. you, can, you can infer from that that probably that person... Like I, I just saw an interview with the, the editor of the holdovers, Kevin Tent, and mm-hmm. and Alexander Payne, who's worked with him for thirty years now. He basically said on his demo reel, the first thing he watched was a two minute uninterrupted cut, and Alexander Payne said, "Like, why are you showing me in your editing reel a two minute shot of something?" And Kevin basically said, "Well, that's to show you that I know when not to cut." And which is a really important thing. Editors right. feel they have to cut where they don't necessarily need to. So, yeah. So that's. I was going to say, it, it sounds easier than it is to watch a film for the quality of the editing. It's very tricky because the better the editing is, the more invisible it is. Absolutely. And if the editor has done a really great job, you don't actually see the work. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, you have to cut over and, for that. and yeah, it is sort of known as the invisible art. And it's kind of one of the reasons why, unfortunately, Editors, I don't want to say don't get the respect they deserve, but we're sort of never thought about because it's not as tangible as photography or set design or costumes or makeup or all these other things or composers or music. Those things you can clearly identify, like I like that music or I like that set design, but editing, it's very abstract. I say to my students all the time, of all your department heads, of all your crew members, The editor is the one person who, where you don't cut corners. It has to be someone who is a creative collaborator. Ultimately, the film you end up with is the film that you edit. It's not what you wrote. It's not what you shot. It's what you edit. It's the final draft, yeah. Yeah. I kind of by necessity, but it was a blessing in disguise, ended up um, editing a lot of my work and as a director. And I, you know, I know like as an editor, you can add a comic you know, you can add comic timing, you can add dramatic moment, you can do so much. So at this point, I, I shoot like an editor, I direct like an editor because I... Mm-hmm. So my question to you is, as an editor, do you prefer working with a director who kind of like puts it in your lap and call me when you have a cut and we'll watch through it? Or do you prefer the ed- the director who's like, give me a second keyboard, <laughs> um, and like, and you work together that way? I would say that the first version where they kind of put it in your lap and like do your magic kind of thing, those are fun to work with because they, there's a lot of trust there, which is you know, but it doesn't mean that the other director who is an editor, it's it's a little more tasking because they're really gonna. Uh, deal with every little frame, like every little eye twitch, every little, which at the end of the day, I'm happy because they're perfectionists and, and that's okay. And it'll push me to be better. I think one of the things out of all of this is to be open-minded and more than anything as an editor, it's, you have to have a certain dose of humility because you could work on something and think it's the best thing since sliced bread. And then they'll go like, oh, that didn't work, did it? And you, you have to sort of like suck it up and go, okay, well, let's try something else, you know? But uh, mm-hmm. but I mean, it's like an, anything in the arts. In terms of the directors, I would say probably at the end of the day, we go deeper with a director who's more of an editor. One thing I do at the end of most of the films I work on, uh, I do what I call um, daily uh, sequences. So let's say if the film's 30 days of shooting, I have 30 sequences with all the material. So just as I'm locking the film, I'll just scroll through all those for, mm. you know, it doesn't take much time. Just kind of scroll. And then if there's a shot I remember from way back when, I'm like, why isn't this in the movie? And I'll try to find a way to put it, you know, like just to be sure that, you know, we've gotten everything mm. we could out of the material. So, um, Arthur, I'll close with one last question. If you got to go back and talk to young Arthur, who's just starting out and editing his first project, what advice would you give him? Um, good luck. But I would say one thing, which I remember when I started out, don't worry so much about continuity. Edit 
for performance, edit for emotion. That should be your guiding light in everything. Amen. Because I remember on the first film I did, which I was so thrilled to be editing. So I went on set and that's another thing I don't do very often. I mean, I did it for Poland, but that was particular. I try never to go on set because the less you're connected to what's going on there, the more you're focused on the actual material and you're not sort of like thinking about, oh, wait, the room was this way. So this has, but if you're only looking at the material, you're a little more objective. Um, and also like, so on the first film, uh, the producer just making conversations. So how's it going? I'm like, oh, it's great. I said, oh, there's some continuity issues, but it's okay. We'll figure it out. So what do you mean? I said, well, this, act, you know, I sort of pointed out that the actors weren't very good with continuity. And like half hour later, I got a call from the script for I said, what did you tell them? They, they were going to fire me. I said, oh my God. I called the producer. I said, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. And you know, that's when I realized, you know, that's just our job. Like it could be the worst cost continuity ever. There's always a way to make it work. So. Uh, and even if something is not in continuity, but you're emotionally engaged in the scene, then it'll fly. It'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's the biggest thing from like the younger version of me. And the other one is, you know, trust the performance, don't overcut, you know, all those things that when you're young, you feel like, oh, this is too slow. I have to make it go faster. And, and there's a lot of power in staying on the shot. Like that's probably the thing over the years that you learn. More and mm. more is, is the power of, of staying on something versus cutting away. Uh, mm -hmm. and just in terms of generally speaking, like just relax and enjoy. Don't be so stressed about things. This is all really great advice and, um, and consistent with any work I've done. Arthur, thank you so, so, so much. Uh, really any last words you want to leave us with if you want. Well, I feel like it went by in a flash. So thank you for that. Uh, I feel like I probably could have said more things, but, um, no, I would just say for aspiring filmmakers, it's like, I, I, I feel like the, the passion for filmmaking is this little flame that you have behind your head. Sometimes people will come over and just blow it out, but you have to sort of protect it and push on and carry on. And if you're passionate, there's no reason why you can't sort of keep going. And if it's just doing a short film or helping someone else on their short film, you know, you never know, just, you know, follow your gut and there's a place for, for, for you somewhere. So. Very well said. Thank you so, so much. Thank you. My pleasure. It was great talking yeah. to you. You've subscribed to my channel. You love these videos. It's time for that 90 minute masterclass where I help you eliminate writing blocks and arrive at your best screenplays. Join me at the independentfilmschool.com. Link is below and I'll invite you to my training. It is absolutely free. I'll see you there.